I look a lot like my dad. Uh, in fact, uh, those of you who have known my dad or knew my dad uh, recognize that uh, we talk a lot, uh, talk a lot alike. Uh, our smile is the same. I even colored my hair the same as him. Um, in fact, uh, today I am wearing uh, uh, one of his ties in his honor. Oh, look, it's his Alabama tie. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> But those folks who saw him teach, my dad taught Sunday school for over 40 years. And uh, sometimes his Sunday school class would come up here or I would be uh, visiting over the weekend and dad would wake me up and say, you're teaching my Sunday school class this morning. Okay. And I would go teach a Sunday school class and when I would teach or dad would teach, they would come up and they would be a little more blunt in their assessment of us. And they would say something like, oh, I see where your dad gets it, or now I see where you get it. Or if, you, if they're really Southern, they'll say something like, you're the spitting image of your dad. <laughs> spitting image. It's an, old, it's an old slang term that comes from a very, very old story in England where a son is described as being so much like his father that it looks like the father had literally spit him out of his mouth. Spitting image. I am the spitting image of my dad. I can't help that. I have his gestures, I have his walk, I have his talk. When I get excited, I rub my hands together just like he does. That's not something I planned. I didn't get up one day and go, boy, today I'm gonna learn how to do this, okay? I just caught myself one day going, oh, I'm my dad, you know? <laughs> it's genetic. It's who I am. It's not what I do. It's who I am. One time when the disciple Philip was talking to Jesus, and they asked Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus answers, how long have I been with you that you would ask to see the Father? Philip, don't you understand that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? Now, if Jesus had been a southerner, he would have said, I'm the spitting image of my father. I'm the spitting image of my father. If you've seen me, you've seen him. Jesus came to show us that. Jesus came to portray that in real life, to be the spitting image of his father. Not only that, he calls us to be the spitting image of him. The word Christian means little Christ. Or again, if we, were to written, if we had written that passage from Antioch there in Acts, if we had written it in the Deep South, we would have said this was the first place that the that Christians were called Christian because they were the spitting image of Christ. Now, we are 21st century Americans. We know the goal. We got it written down. Be the spitting image of Christ. Goal number one. How do we do that? What's the strategy? What do we have to do to do that? What, what, what are those things on the list? And Jesus gives us that in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. These great passages, 5, 6, and 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to read the Beatitudes, where Jesus talks about how the people of his kingdom act and live. But understand what he is saying. He doesn't describe what we do. He describes who we are. This is what the Father looks like, Jesus says in the Beatitudes. And his children are spitting images of him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Stand with me in honor of God's word. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to teach them, saying, the, uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of, God, of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled on by men. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden, and no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather a lampstand, and it gives light to all of those who are in the house. In the same way, in the same way, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine before men so that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Make us into your essence so that who we are and what we do is a spitting image of you, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It is a very dark world that we live in. I don't know that we need to spend any time talking about how dark the situation is or how bad our our country is now suffering as it struggles with values, as it struggles with identity, as it struggles with issues. We're all concerned about the future. It is a very, very dark place. That is why this verse 16 is so important, that we let our light shine before men so that they'll see your good works. And in seeing your good works, they will give glory, they will give praise to your Father who is in heaven. They'll begin to understand that there is something different about you. That they'll they'll understand that there is a quality, an essential difference about who you are. Now, I understand that we do live in a dark place, but I'll remind you of something I tell you all the time. If it is dark in a place, it is not the victory of the dark, it is the failure of the light. Okay, you walk in, you flip on the light switch, the light bulb goes, scares you to death. You do not step back and yell, the dark killed another one. You say, the light bulb's out. So if our nation is indeed dark, if our communities are indeed in the shadows, it is not because the darkness has won. It is because the light has failed. And it doesn't have to be very much light for the light to push back the darkness. It doesn't have to be a very big candle. It doesn't have to be a very big light bulb to provide everybody in the house with enough light to see. It doesn't take very much of a lighthouse for the captain to be able to find it when he's looking for it. It doesn't take very much light for those who are lost in the darkness to see enough light to be able to find their way home. I know your office is a difficult place to work. I know you may be the only Christian there. That's exactly why Jesus gave you the job. Dark places need light. That's why he sent you. I know your community may be a difficult place to live. That's why he sent you. I know you may be the only Christian in in the wing of your dorm. You may be the only Christian in the major that you're taking. I understand that. That's why Jesus sent you. It's not the power of the dark that changes things. It's the power of the light. Now, to help you understand this, Jesus gave us two points, two metaphors of essence, light and salt. You are the light of the world, not if you work hard, I will grant you the power to be the light of the world, not if you're really super spiritual, you can earn the right to be light of the world. You are, not you do light, you are light, not you do salt, you are salt. By its nature, light is a change maker. It makes things happen like photosynthesis. 
The light doesn't stand up and say, hey, let's go out and photosynthesize some things today. It just does it because it's light. The salt doesn't sit in the shaker and say, that tomato really needs us. It just does it. It just does it. The people listening to Jesus must have snickered out loud this idea that you would go to all the trouble to light a lamp and put it under a basket. Well, that defeats the purpose. The, the, the house would not be any more light. It would still be dark even though the light was on. No more than some of us who have said to the world, we really don't want to stand out. Yes, we believe in Jesus, but we really don't want to stand out. We want to kind of blend in. And how in the world does light blend into darkness? How does that happen? How can light cease to be light so that it doesn't affect the darkness? By putting out the light. And then the room is oh so much darker. Jesus said a salt can lose its saltiness. Now, uh, those of us in 21st century America are going, how can sodium chloride not be sodium chloride anymore? And we think about this little blue round box with that little girl carrying the uh, umbrella. That's not what he's talking about. There are no refineries in the time of Jesus. You dug up salt. And when you dig stuff up, you get salt and you get dirt. So some of what you would put on your food would be salt. Some of it would be dirt. But if you were not careful and you allowed that dirt, that salt to get wet and wash the salinity out of it, then it was just dirt. It wasn't salty anymore. It was just dirt and it was thrown out. It was useless. It wasn't good for anything. So what happens if you lose your essence? If you lose the ability to become a change agent, something that makes the moment different because you aren't in it. Salt changes the way food tastes. The food doesn't say, I know you put salt on me, but we're just not going to be salty. I don't care what you do. No, the salt changes it. Why? Because that's what salt does. It changes things. The light doesn't say, I know you turned the light on, but I'm not leaving. Darkness doesn't have a choice. That's what light does. So let me ask you a question. Do your friends, your co-workers, do your unbelieving friends, do your unbelieving co-workers, do the students near you on your hall ask you about your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's what he says, isn't it? Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they will give praise to the Father who is in heaven. That they will see your good works. Do your friends ask you about why you're different when the, when the business is under pressure? Why your marriage is different? Why your relationship with your children is different? Do they ask you about why you have different goals than everybody else or why you have a different definition of success? Does your co-worker, do your unbelieving friends ask you about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Why not? We all get worried about evangelism. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to start the conversation. That's because the world starts the conversation. Got it? So that they will see your good works and come ask you, what is different about you? How do you keep it together when the whole world's falling apart? How do you live the way that you do? I want to know what's different about you. Then we tell them, we want to tell you about Jesus. Why don't they ask us? Because we were sold a bill of goods, and here was the bill of goods. Our culture said to us, okay, you want to be a Christian, that's fine. Be a Christian, just keep it to yourself. Just don't tell anybody. Just take your little light, let it shine on Sunday, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, shine, shine. But on Monday... Let's put it back under the bushel basket. Shh, it'll be our secret. And what we didn't know is 
But then when we did that, we changed the essence of our nature. We changed who we are in this compromise, and we blame the world because it's dark. It's the failure of the light. Wow. How did we do this? Well, it's what Jesus talks about in these first handful of verses from uh, the, the, what we call the Beatitudes. Now, Jesus is not bringing us any new teachings. You can find scriptural references that refer to this exact teaching and somewhere in the Bible. And, some, and a lot of times you can find a one-to-one -one correlation in what Jesus said and how Jesus described himself later. For instance, um, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus says in Matthew, all of you who are tired and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Why? My burden is light, my yoke fits, and I am, what's the word? Meek and low in heart. Same word. Come and follow me because I'm meek. Wow. It's a one-to-one -one correlation. Jesus is saying, this is who the Father is. This is who I am. This is who I want you to be. So we read these verses. We read them. Blessed are the, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know in the presence of God you're broke. You don't have anything to make it happen. You don't have anything that God would owe you. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has loaned money to the Lord? Paul asked that the Lord now owes him. Blessed. Blessed are those who mourn over their sins and the sins of the world. Blessed are those who weep the way Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have covered you under my wings like a mother hen pulls her chicks to her and you wouldn't do it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. John chapter 4. He's been talking with a Samaritan woman. The disciples have been off getting something to eat. They come back and say, here's your food. And he says, I'm not hungry anymore. Why? Because I have food that you know nothing about. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those the, uh, who, who make peace, reconcile. That's the word. For they will be called, the phrase is sons of God. And we always get upset going, well, do, uh, don't girls get in here too? It's an idiom. It's slang. It is, blessed are those who make peace, who reconcile broken world to the God who made the world. Why? Because they will be called the spitting image of the Father. That's that phrase. You'll be the spitting image of the Lord. Blessed are those when you are persecuted. Blessed are you when they throw you in jail. Blessed are you when they say all kind of evil against you because of me. That's the way they treated the prophets. And we read that and we say, that's great, Mike. It's beautiful. It's almost poetry. Can we cross stitch it and put it on our refrigerator? It is wonderful. But nobody lives this way, Mike. That's not the way our world is. Uh, 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 Pastor uh, Dr. Uh, J.B. Phillips uh, preached uh, a generation ago. He wrote his own version of our world's beatitudes. I've got a copy here just so I can get it right. Happy are the pushers, for they get on in the world. Happy are the hard boiled for they never let life hurt them. Happy are those who complain, for they get their way in the end. Happy are the blasé, for they never worry over their sins. Happy are the slave drivers, for they get results. Happy are the knowledgeable, mean people of the world, for they know their way around. Happy are the troublemakers, for they make people take notice of them. Now I know you're going, wow, Jesus has a much prettier beatitude. I really like the way Jesus, Jesus says it. But Dr. Phillips got it right. This is the way the world is. 
Blessed are the troublemakers, for they make people pay attention to them. Blessed are the whiners, because they finally get their way in the end. Mike, that's the way the world is. It's a jungle out there. It's dog eat dog. That's the way the world really is, Mike. Don't you get that? Yes, I do. I get that. I understand how the world is. What I need to help you understand is it's not the way the kingdom is. Oh. That's the tough moment, isn't it? Now you have to choose. Now you have to choose where is it you want to be successful? Where is it that you want to be blessed? Now you have to choose. Does Jesus understand what he's talking about? Now you have to figure out, does Jesus have it right? You see, Jesus came to show us how to live the God-focused life. He fulfilled the Beatitudes. His example for us tells us, one, not only is living this way possible, it is expected. Now, I, I know you have the same reaction I did. Oh, that's great. Put the bar as high as you want to, Mike. I can't get over it at this high. I won't be able to jump over it that high. Who can do this? Nobody can do this. Right? How many of you have kept your New Year's resolutions? That's what I thought. Okay? Nobody can do it. In fact, Mike, in fact, Paul couldn't do this, could he? Didn't Paul say something like this? Funny how good you are at remembering those passages of Scripture. It's where Paul says, you know, I have tried harder than anybody. I kept the law. I exhausted myself doing that. Here's what I found out. Last paragraph of chapter 7. The things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing anyway. I find myself at war within my own body. What I want to do, what I know to do, what I can't do, what I don't want to do, that I, do. I find myself at war anyway. Who can save this wretch of a man that I am? Now, we all know that. See, even Paul couldn't do it. So, I don't know why you're talking to us if the Apostle Paul couldn't do it. Well, he admitted what you and I need to admit. We cannot do this in our own strength. But that's not the only passage of Scripture Paul wrote. Mm, Philippians, oh, 4. What does he say in Philippians 4? I can do all things. All things. How? Through him who gives me strength. I can do all things. Blessed are the peacemakers. I can do that, Paul says, through the strength that Christ gives me. Mm, Galatians 3. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but He lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. So, the same Jesus that kept these Beatitudes in his earthly ministry now lives inside of me, keeping these beatitudes through his life in my life. In John chapter 3, there's a famous discussion with Nicodemus. Nicodemus asked the same question we want to ask Jesus. We've heard you teach. How in the world can we do this? And Jesus' answer, you have to be born again. Let me put it down for all of us. You can't live this way until you're born this way. Okay? I am the spitting image of my dad. I was born that way. It's my DNA. You want to be the spitting image of the Father who's in heaven. 
you're going to have to be born that way. You can't live this way until you're born this way. Until you're born into the kingdom that Christ came to give us. In a wonderful book called The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard, a professor at Southern Cal, writes this about Jesus. He's not just nice. He's brilliant. He's the smartest man to have ever lived. He is now supervising the, the entire course of the history of the universe and simultaneously preparing the rest of history, the rest of the universe for our role in it. He always has the best information on everything and certainly on those things that matter most to us in human life. So let us now hear the Sermon on the Mount, his teachings on who has the good life and who it is among us that is most blessed. He has the best information on everything especially on those things that matter most to human life. So let us now hear his teaching about who has the good life, about who it is that is really blessed. That's the choice, isn't it? I know. That's not the way the world is. I know. It is the way the kingdom is. And this is the invitation that Christ came to bring his disciples to bring those who followed him and the invitation he comes to bring you and me now. If you want to be part of this kingdom, this new reality that Jesus comes to bring us is open for you now. But you can't live this way until you're born this way.